Hi, I'm David Torgman. Hi, uh, that's Councillor Torgman. I'm Councillor Mike Cohen. We're very pleased to have you on this snowy Sunday afternoon for a very special lecture. Thank you everybody for, for coming to join us today. Uh, it's, so it's a pleasure to be here and I'm very excited to hear more from our special guest, Mr. Shabtai Shavit. I wanna thank our library director and staff for the incredible work that they have been doing, keeping our many library services open to our residents, including our book pickup. Today's author, author talk is an example of the many virtual programs we have. I wanna thank my co-host and fellow counselor, Mike Cohen for bringing this event to our library. It is my honor to introduce the Consul General of Israel for Quebec and the Atlantic Provinces, Mr. David Levy. Ever since David landed in Montreal, he has made significant impact in linking Canada and Israel with the many programs and impressive personal dedication. Thank you very much and enjoy today's program. Bonjour tout le monde, dear friends, shalom. The last year has been extremely difficult for all of us. Even though the Consulate of Israel in Montreal remained open every day, the State of Israel was closed, at least for non-Israelis. So I imagine this must have been very difficult for many of you since you could not travel to our homeland and see your friends and relatives. We're all hoping that now with the vaccination moving forward, life will soon return to normal. In the meantime, we can all connect with Israel in other ways. For example, by watching excellent Israeli TV or movies, listening to wonderful Israeli music, preparing Israeli food, of course, and by reading an Israeli book. This leads us to today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, Shabtai Shavit is an exceptional person who dedicated his life for the security of the State of Israel. From his very early years as a soldier in one of the most distinguished units of the IDF, then rising up the ranks of the Mossad and leading it under three consecutive prime ministers. Shabtai Shavit epitomizes the definition of a civil servant, Mesharet Sibu, and we all owe him so much. I am sure this is going to be an amazing conversation that will keep us all captivated and on the edge of our seats. I personally read this book in its Hebrew version. It is wonderful that it is now available in English. Ladies and gentlemen, until we can meet in person, I wish that you all stay healthy and safe. Toda raba velitraot. A few months ago, uh, writing for The Suburban, I was uh, sent a copy of the book, uh, of uh, this, this amazing book about the Mossad. I'm not a big book reader, uh, uh, to be honest with you, uh, but I've always been fascinated with the Mossad and, and Israel, and this was like a real-life spy novel uh, for Mr. Shavit. I had a chance to interview him for The Suburban, and I asked him at that time if he would consider doing a lecture for the community at large. And at that time, I contacted Councillor Torgman, who's got the library portfolio, Janine West and Danielle, and then we asked Mr. Shavit, and he agreed. And here we are today. Um, it, you know, one of the one of the shows that uh, all of us listen to uh, on CJD Monday to Friday is the Aaron Rand show. Aaron Rand uh, and I go back decades. Aaron's got a Cote St. Luke roots. His mom still lives in Cote St. Luke. He he covers our community quite regularly on his show, and uh, we're very pleased to have him today as the moderator. And he will be the one who'll be asking questions to Mr. Shavit. Uh, followed by, uh, at the end, uh, Janine West will say some words, and our mayor, Mitchell Brownstein. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Aaron Rand. Aaron? All right. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I would like to say, if I could, there he is, uh, to Mr. Shavit, shalom, and thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to meet you over Zoom. Shalom. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to meet with you. Well, there are a lot of questions, obviously, that I have. I know we have a limited amount of time. So let me begin with the first one, which is why you decided to write this book in the first place. And if you were worried, because it's a very uh, extensive description of what the Mossad has been doing over the past 30, 40, 50 years, were you worried that you might be revealing some issues, some secrets here that you shouldn't be? Uh, first of all, I want to, uh, I, I want to uh, stress that... Uh, 
the book is not the sort of a uh, clock and dagger kind of books that uh, are uh, to be found in, uh, in, in, in bookstores. It is a um, collection of uh, a very long experience in intelligence, national security, politics, wars, and so on and so forth that I um, kept deep in, deep in my heart more than 20 years uh, after retiring from, uh, from the government. And uh, only uh, after these 20 years of being a, um, an ordinary citizen of the state, I decided to, uh, to share all this uh, huge amount of, uh, of uh, comments uh, narratives, um, memories, even if you like recommendations, um, uh, so that uh, um, the uh, the Mossad will be uh, will be uh, um, a sort of a uh, another legacy uh, in the state of Israel, and all this without to the best of my knowledge, without divulging big secrets. Okay, well, that's good to know. L let me start with something that was very fascinating for me, especially considering the geopolitical shift now in the Middle East. You know, we have a situation now where Iran uh, has become a major player in the Middle East. And I was reading in the book, you actually, earlier in your career, spent time in Iran, quite some time actually, when Iran was still considered an Israeli ally. C can you describe what that time was like? Well, the relationship between uh, Iran and, uh, and Israel uh, started in the uh, 50s of the uh, 20th century. And uh, uh, those relationships, which were uh, short of a form formal decision as uh, allies, this, the, the nature of relationship between the two uh, countries can, can best be uh, defined as, as an, an alliance. And uh, it took place because uh, of a, a meeting of, uh, of mutual interests. The uh, Iran was ruled with the Shah, uh, Iranian Shah, who, uh, who adopted the Western um, diplomacy and foreign policy. And uh, we were a uh, very young country in the uh, Middle East, also uh, democratic and uh, liberal and uh, Western, you know, uh, uh, viewpoint and, and, and policies. And um, for, for Iran, it was very interesting, very important to establish a, a, a relationship with us um, in order to, uh, in order to um, get our support vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the US. And for us, the relationship uh, with Iran was a part of uh, the vision of the uh, founding father of Israel, Ben-Gurion. Uh, 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 when, he, when he defined the, uh, um, the national security principles, of the, of the newborn state of Israel, one of these principles was that Israel should have allies in the second circle of the, of the Middle East, of Israel, and uh, preferably countries that were not part of the Arab world. And Iran, as uh, I'm sure you, you are aware of, is not considered to be an, an, Arab, uh, an Arab country. Iran is more of a, uh, of a German uh, uh, culture and, 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 uh, and, and race uh, than Arab. And the relationship between Iran and the rest of the Arab of the Arab world, the undercurrent of it is uh, is a history of uh, of um, 
hatred and contempt among them. And all these reasons together, put together, uh, directed both countries to establish, uh, to establish this, this alliance. And obviously that situation has turned 180 degrees now. Iran continues to basically come out and say it wants Israel's destruction in so many words. Can, can that relationship be salvaged? Um, today I would uh, answer you uh, that uh, basically they can be salvaged, but uh, uh, we have to meet a few uh, preconditions to, uh, to that development. And the, the first one is the, the change of the present regime in Iran. The present regime in Iran is a religious a Shiite, which is the most extreme uh, uh, sect in, in, in Islam. The regime is a religious, a Sharia kind of uh, regime. And the, uh, the, the Shiite uh, sect um, does not believe in, in, in coexistence in the world. Their uh, vision is to uh, convert the world of infidels to become Muslims, Shiites, for them to be able to build the, uh, the eternal Muslim caliphate. This is, even though the, the, it, it sounds like a, a story from medieval times, this is in, in uh, a few sentences, the, uh, the main essence of the present regime in, in, uh, in Iran. And since uh, Israel and the Jews are um, considered to be the, uh, part of the infidel world, um, they believe that they should fight us, distract us, and annihilate us. So uh, as, uh, as, as things seem to be today, um, the answer to your question is that uh, uh, I, it is very hard to, uh, to salvage the uh, former relationship that, uh, that we had with Iran. In order for, in order for this vision to, uh, to come to fruition, first, uh, uh, the present regime should be, should be replaced or changed um, to become a secular, world, a, a, a secular country instead of a religious a country, and uh, to uh, uh, to find additional uh, or new common interests, which we can find in order to um, to renew the uh, relations uh, between these two countries. But it's. Um, it's a big and, and, and very difficult uh, change to take place. I'd like to go back and talk a little bit about your career in the Mossad. From what I understand, you've basically been involved in one way or another uh, for more than 50 years, so most of your adult life. I'm just curious quickly, how and why did you become involved? Um, listen, since I, uh, I was a um, young boy, at the age of uh, five or six, I, I started to learn Arabic. And I started to learn Arabic because I uh, realized at this early age of mine that in order to live in the Middle East, um, you have to know your neighbors, or if you like, your adversaries. And uh, the uh, main thing to do it is, is to speak their language and to know their culture and history. So uh, I lived in a very small, uh, in a very small um, village, in which we had in the backyard uh, uh, olive trees, and uh, we had two Arab uh, villages neighboring our village. And during the season, the Arab neighbors used to come to our uh, backyard in order to. Uh, to, um, uh, um, to to take the uh, the olives from the from the trees, and uh, that's how I started to learn my my Arabic, and then and then I uh, 
high school, I took uh, Arabic uh, uh, literature, language and literature and history of the Middle East as majors. And I graduated from high school uh, uh, with this uh, uh, subjects. In the military, I had, uh, I continued to learn the language uh, part-time. And then after the uh, compulsory service in the IDF, I, um, I, I registered to the uh, uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem and I took also as majors the same subjects. So uh, graduating from the uh, university, I was loaded with uh, all the requirements to apply to, uh, to the Mossad to become a, uh, a member of the Mossad. So uh, this is the answer to your, to your question. Could, could you ever have imagined yourself as head of the Mossad in your wildest dreams? Um, um, what, I, what I can uh, testify about myself, and I'll do it very humbly, is that uh, anything that I was involved with was motivated by uh, trying to uh, achieve excellence and to do the best in order to uh, to succeed so uh, when i uh, when i entered they started to uh, to work in the mossad uh, um, i first of all i i i saw it as a service to uh, to the state and to the national security of the state and it was uh, obvious that uh, i'll 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 do anything in my in, pi in my power to contribute to 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 this objective, and uh, it brought me to uh, to where I uh, reached in the end of my uh, service. You know, as you look back, and and I found it fascinating in the book to consider the changes that you lived through in the Mossad, and then as head of the Mossad from from eighty nine to ninety six. One of them being, of course, cyber terrorism, something that didn't even exist back in the 60s and 70s and 1980s. How did that change things for the Mossad? Uh, it, it, uh, it has changed dramatically, but I want to, uh, to correct what, you, what, what you've just said. Um, I, uh, I contend that, uh, that um, cyber existed also earlier, but it had another name. It was not defined as... Uh, as, this, as with, with the definition of cyber. I, uh, I can take you back to uh, 1954 uh, when a, uh, a, a, a group of Israeli soldiers um, did um, cyber in Syria. Cyber, which was based on 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 uh, on the technology of the fifties, of of the twentieth century, um, the essence of uh, of cyber is to uh, to be to be capable or to have the tools in order to uh, to uh, dig deep into your adversaries. Uh, uh, technological infrastructure in order to extract intelligence from that. What they did back in 54 was exactly that, but uh, the only one difference is that uh, we didn't call it uh, cyber then. Of course, since then, to, to, the, to our days now, technology has, uh, has become uh, almost a, uh, a miracle, so, so enhanced and so... Uh, and so uh, 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 developed uh, that uh, one of the one of the consequences of of the cyber today is the world has become completely transparent. There are no secrets anymore because uh, with the help of cyber you can you can reach almost anywhere, anytime, and uh, to be able to. Uh, to, to get uh, unbelievable kind of information. 
Yeah, I, I'm wondering if you could imagine what it would be like to run an operation like the Mossad now versus what it was like when you were heading it up in the 90s. Wow, well, I can I can give you I can give you an example that uh, uh, during even in the early 70s, uh, the uh, the main mean of communication was uh, was the uh, um, the 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 communication of World War Two, you know Morse. You know what Morse is? It did it da da did it da da did it da da. This was the kind of communication, even in the seventies. Today, with a with a regular iPhone, we can reach uh, any point on the, on planet Earth, any time, all weather, day and night, and also ciphered. So this is the this is the difference between uh, communication today and in uh, past times. So I want to go to another point that you mentioned in the book and have you perhaps explain that you you stepped down as head of the Mossad after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Why was that a pivotal moment for you? What what made you do that? Um. You know, in retrospect, I have served with uh, three prime ministers. And uh, as you know, the director of the Mossad is uh, reporting directly to the uh, prime minister. There is no any um, any kind of uh, of a uh, um, buffer. Uh, 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 any buffer, and any buffer, or any inter- intermediary between the director of Mossad and the prime minister. And I worked with three of them. The first one who uh, assigned me to the to the position was Itzhak Shamir. Yitzhak Shamir was uh, politically, he was um, on the right side of the political map. And uh, then I served with uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who succeeded him in 1992. And after the assassination of Rabin, uh, Prime Minister Perez asked me to, uh, to stay on. Um, and I accepted to uh, to stay on for another six months until the uh, 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 elections that uh, were uh, planned as a result of the assassination of of uh, Fabin. Uh, but you know the uh, the job of the uh, director of the Mossad is is not an easy one. And uh, after after six years. I uh, came to the conclusion that uh, I should start at least to think of retiring. And I started to talk about it with uh, Prime Minister Rabin when he was still alive. Um, so when he, uh, when he was assassinated, I decided, uh, and, and, and it's interesting, I did this decision standing in the uh, in the basement of the hospital where uh, where they brought uh, Rabin uh, immediately after being uh, being shot and while waiting for the uh, director of the hospital to come out from the uh, surgery rooms uh, to report to us i made a decision that uh, if, if if he comes out God forbid, and 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 declare that uh, the prime minister <coughs> was dead. I'll uh, I'll retire. I imagine how difficult the decision that must have been for you. Not only because it meant the end of your career, but because I think people consider the Mossad infallible to a degree. That there are no mistakes made. That everything is perfect. And then you see a situation like the prime minister being shot and wonder what happened. How did you react to that? Well, by, uh, by, I have to, I have to, uh, to say first that uh, the, uh, the assignment of uh, or the, or the uh, duty 
of the uh, personal security and safety of the prime minister in the Israeli system is is uh, lies with the uh, security service, not with the Mossad. Uh, I can add in by saying that uh, the division of labor between the uh, different uh, security and intelligence organizations is such that the Mossad is operating only abroad and not in Israel. The responsibility, the domestic responsibility, uh, the responsibility over Israel is with the uh, 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 Shin Bet, which is this, uh, the security, the the uh, uh, the uh, domestic security organization. Um, I, I I don't say it uh, in order to in order to excuse myself or, or whatever, but it 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 just was not our job. Still, I felt uh, you you may imagine how did I, how did I feel. When it uh, when it took place, uh, and and uh, um, nobody believed it, that su that such a thing can 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 take place can happen in Israel. No one believed in it. I, I remember. I, I remember it was. He was assassinated Sunday as uh, Saturday night during a big event which was uh, which was uh, done in in, in, in in the biggest uh, place in, in Tel Aviv and um, Friday a day before the assassination um, I I, uh, I took part in a in a meeting with with the Prime Minister and with the uh, director of the uh, security service and the chief of staff and the director of intelligence um, Fridays, each Fridays, he used to work in Tel Aviv, not in, uh, not in Jerusalem. And uh, the uh, Friday was dedicated to, uh, to the IDF and security issues. And uh, when we started the uh, when we started the the meeting, the director of the security service uh, raised his hand and 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 uh, and and told the prime minister and us that the uh, activities of the extreme religious uh, 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 groups in the country against the Prime Minister uh, worried him very much. And I'll never forget the response from uh, from uh, Rabin. Rabin just uh, with his hand did this kind of a, of a movement and told him let's uh, let's concentrate on the issues at hand and uh, and leave it. Uh, and, and and this uh, this small story took place less than 24 hours before the assassination. Um, you're very candid in your book, you know, a little earlier on, you used the word transparency about how the, the citizenry, the population in general has shifted, has changed. You talk about the media as well, but back in your day, it would seem the Mossad could pretty much do whatever they wanted, didn't really have to answer, didn't have to worry about the media. You find that very, very different now, don't you? Yeah, it is very different. It is very different. You know, uh, um, one of the uh, one of the main uh, principles or strategies, if you like, of the Mossad was secrecy and confidentiality and compartmentalization. And there were many reasons for that. Not just uh, because uh, if nobody knows you and nobody knows what you do, then uh, you uh, 
you have uh, you have all the deniability in, deniability in the world. You know that is was that is that was not the case. The case is that <clears throat> as less as your advisories know you, you you have a better deterrence because if and when they know you and you you learn your habits and capabilities and intentions and uh, all of a sudden you become a, a normal human a normal human being from whom you don't have to uh, to be scared of when they don't know you and they don't they don't know about you and about your capabilities and and plans and intentions and strategies the you have a better uh, deterrence and uh, they think about you as as being something somebody who is invincible if you if you if you understand what i mean um but uh, <laughs> once once uh, I, by the way i was the last director whose uh, identity was uh, was uh, was uh, not divulged for the public the first time my name came up, was printed in the israeli uh, newspapers was uh, when it was declared that i uh, that i finished my term um today as we said the world is transparent and uh, when the uh, incumbent director of the Mossad uh, have a meeting has a meeting with Pompeo uh, in 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 uh, in uh, Washington it's uh, it's uh, it appears on 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 the, uh, the head headlines of 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 all the uh, newspapers in 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 the world with 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 pictures as well but uh, maybe i belong to another world uh but i have uh, i have to admit that uh, the world is 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 changing so as a final question i know we're going to run short on time with everything that's been going on now in the middle east and those uh, peace deals being brokered in this last administration with qatar and saudi arabia apparently coming on board how, how much does that change? How much better is that for Israel? Are these really peace deals or are these trade deals? Uh, well, I uh, I consider myself being an optimistic person. I, I always was. And thinking about these developments, I do believe, I really do believe that it is a window of opportunity to uh, to pursue a, a a global, regional, and domestic strategy that that will that stand a, a big chance to end once and for all the conflict between us and the Arabs, and especially between us and and the Palestinians. And I'll, uh, since we are short of time, I'll do it in bullets. If I, if I look at the world today from the top down, we have the US as a superpower, which unfortunately, uh, unfortunately has to invest a lot in order to, to reach to, to, to go back to the place it has in the world uh, until a few years ago. And we have China as a, uh, the number one competitor to the US, and uh, uh, it may uh, it may it may take, China may take over even a, a, the US and Russia, which is uh, chasing these uh, two uh, superpowers, uh, trying to go to to go back to what uh, Russia was during the uh, Cold War era. Um, the Middle East is 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 a, 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 a 
is a spot which to a very large extent um, um, decides the uh, future not only of the Middle East but uh, but rather to to the rest of the world. Uh, let's uh, pinpoint to two issues only. One is the the uh, 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 competition to to uh, acquire nuclear military and nuclear capabilities, and the other is global jihad or the global terrorism. Uh, these are these are two issues which uh, determine to a large extent, extent the, the future of, 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 the, uh, of the world. Now, we, uh, we have today peace agreements with two countries, Egypt and Jordan, which by the way, the, uh, the Mossad was very instrumental in in building up this, uh, these two peace agreements. And we have the uh, very positive developments um, with the uh, upgrading of relationship with the Emirates and, and the other. By the way, I personally, now I can, can, I can say it without divulging big secrets. I, I uh, was uh, um, visiting all these places uh, in, in, in early 90s. But the relationships then were conditioned by uh, confidentiality and secrecy. Today, they, uh, those countries agreed to, uh, to, bring, uh, to bring a relationship into the open. I translate it as a, as a very strong sign to the Palestinians especially to the Palestinians, telling them, listen, listen, guys, we, we have supported you for the last 70 years. The world is changing. The world is not standing still. And now we have common denominator between us, the Emirates and Saudi Arabia and others, with Israel against the common enemy, which is Iran. Saudi to Iran is identical to what Israel is to Iran today. We were, speaking, we were talking earlier about the relationship between Iran and the others. Now, I believe that, that the present situation is such that if America stays in the region and, and, and stops the the strategy of getting out from the uh, Middle East, and by the way, not from the uh, for only the Middle East. Uh, um, uh, uh, Trump was 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 talking about let's bring back uh, all our all our boys and guys, and 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 become again a fortress America. No, if America wants to to become again influential and. And 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 the first and the first rate uh, yeah, superpower, it must remain in the Middle East. Now, America in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia, Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and the other Emirates. It is it is a, an opportunity to uh, construct a new global uh, axis, which will stand up to China on, hand, on one hand, to Russia on the other hand, and to deal with the two regional powers, Turkey on one hand, Iran on the other hand, and to dictate entirely or to create entirely new environment in the, in the Middle East. If such a, if such a uh, strategy 
comes to fruition, then America should play the role of bringing the Palestinians and the Israelis to the table and to uh, tell them, listen, guys, you are sitting now until uh, until uh, a, a white uh, smoke uh, will come out of the of the chimney, and we'll finish it uh, for once and for all. So I, I I really do see a an opportunity. Of course, there are preconditions too, but but. Uh, for for many many years now, I I, I consider that if uh, if this uh, window of opportunity will will not be taken by mainly by the uh, new uh, presidency of uh, of uh, of Biden, uh, it will be a a big loss. Mr. Shavit, I thank you so much for your time. As I said, it was a pleasure meeting you. I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you so much once again. Thank you for being with you. Thank you. So on behalf of the Code St. Luke Public Library, I'd really like to thank our honored guest, Mr. Shavit, uh, for sharing with us his experiences as well as his incredible insight. It's been a real pleasure for us to have you here with us this afternoon. Um, one thing COVID has done, which is really, really interesting, it's been an unexpected um, uh, uh, outcome is that um, it has allowed us to have guests such as Mr. Shavit from places that are outside of Montreal, where we can all really benefit from um, various opinions and insights. Uh, we, before uh, 2020, we had never even heard of Zoom. We've never been able to do um, uh, lectures like this um, virtually. Uh, so, it's really, really been um, a positive experience in that respect. Um, I also want to thank uh, Michael, uh, Councillor Mike Cohen and Councillor David Torgman for uh, bringing this to us. I want to thank my colleagues, both Danielle Belanger and Daryl Levine uh, for their assistance. Uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, Aaron Rand for all of his uh, Great, great, great questions. Um, so I'm sure many of our audience are wondering, like, where can they read this uh, fascinating book? And uh, certainly we do have copies available at the library. Uh, but Mr. Shavit's uh, publisher has uh, a very, very uh, special offer for you. So I'm just going to let you know if you were interested in purchasing this book, how you can take advantage of uh, an offer of a 30% discount. Uh, so the discount code, I'm going to read it uh, to everyone, is 14FF30, and it offers, again, 30% uh, off, and it expires on March the 28th. Um, I do have a book link uh, that will be posted on our website. And you can also call the, uh, the library uh, to get that link at 514-485-6900 uh, and press three to uh, get the librarian. I believe Danielle uh, will, will put the link in the chat. That was great. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna conclude. First of all, it was great seeing my friend, David Levy. Um, you know, the city of Kotzebue has a very close relationship with Israel. Um, our twin city, Ashkelon, we have one of the highest percentage of Jewish people living in our city. And um, um, there's a lot of connections to, to uh, Israel and also to your family. You know, I, I knew that the, um, we're going to be interviewing the head of the Mossad, former head of the Mossad. So I had to do my own intel. And I found out that, you know, you have a lot of connections with, with uh, Montreal. And um, with relatives in Montreal, and my uh, family is uh, friends with some of your relatives. I even understand that your wife went to my uh, alma mater, McGill, for a year, and that you're. Uh, see, I'm doing my intel, and that yeah. you, you have um, relatives. Maybe it's in-laws that were in municipal politics. I think that might be as true as well. With there's some municipal politics in the family. Anyway, this is what I was. Yeah. Told. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. My. Uh... My wife's uh, 
Um, a, a father, may you rest in peace, uh, was, was the deputy mayor of Natania. There you go. See, so there's a lot of connections. See, I'm doing my intel. I'm showing you. I'm not the yeah, yeah. never head of the Mossad, but I'm doing my intel. <laughs> and it was really wonderful having you. And um, you did, it was a, a wonderful, you know, especially in these times of COVID, when we're all stuck in our homes, um, we really appreciate that uh, we can have events like this. And we appreciate Aaron Rand for spending the time today and every day coming into our homes on the radio and connecting so many of us who are stuck in our homes, particularly our senior population. And we look to Israel for all you do, and we will be watching in the coming months as you, vac- you know, your government vaccinates the entire population. And um, we're, we're looking for good results from, from, uh, from that, um, that uh, vaccination plan by the Israeli government, and may it follow throughout the world. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Cohn, Councillor Torgman, Daniel Belanger, Janine West, for bringing this event to the city of Cote St. Luke. It's, um, it's a wonderful opportunity for us all to get together and we should continue to have these events um, throughout COVID and afterwards as well. So we stay connected with, um, with our residents. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, again, you. a big thanks to Aaron Rand. Uh, and uh, for our next uh, Zoom lecture of this sort, we are definitely going to increase capacity, but uh, the, the, uh, the video will be online in the next couple of hours and we'll share it very much. Uh, David, thank you for co-organizing this with me. Thank you very much. Thank you both. And uh, thank you, Mr. Rand and uh, Mr. Shavit. It was a real, uh, real pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, Mr. Shavit. Thank you so much as well. Thank All you. Right, tomorrow at four o'clock, there's only one radio there. station to listen to, CJD 800. <laughs> Thanks for the plug. You deserve it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.